Good afternoon. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this academic ceremony of Maastricht University. I do so in my capacity of Dean of the Faculty of Law and acting as pro-rector of this university. It's wonderful to see that so many of you found their way here to this beautiful Ola or are participating in this ceremony online. Also very much welcome to have you here. A special words of welcome to the extensive delegation from Vienna, including Professor Lang, Vice-Rector of the University of Vienna, and to Nathalie and Simon, who are both here, and to the parents of the orator. Very good to have you. You are all here for a very special event. This afternoon, we officially install Professor Kasper Jurts to the Chair of International Tax Law. In the Dutch academic tradition, such an installation takes place by way of an inaugural lecture by the new chairholder. So in a few minutes, I will ask Professor Stewart to come forward to officially accept this chair. Before I do so, I would like to say a few more words about Professor Stewart. And I always do so when welcoming a new professor to our community, explaining why it is that we are so happy to have that new professor and are so happy about the new appointment. In the case of Casper, that is not a difficult task at all. Your academic career, if I may say so, started at the Bundesgymnasium in the Fichnerkasse, a famous school right in the heart of your native Vienna. A school also with famous students, including a former Bundespräsident, a Nobel Prize winner, and, and that's of course the zenith of academic standing, also quite a few law professors. I was happy to see that on the Wikipedia page of that gymnasium, um, you are now also listed as one of its famous former students. You then studied law, also in your native Vienna, law and business at the Wirtschaftsuniversität, where you defended your PhD on employees and international tax law in 2012, and did your habilitation in 2018 at the equally famous Institute for Austrian and International Tax Law. Then you worked for KPMG as a tax manager before you joined our university last year. Now, Professor Stewart, with such an academic background um, and with that practical experience, um, you are highly valuable to our faculty and university. For example, when it comes to teaching our students. In particular, also the students in our master's program in international and European tax law. Um, next to its very important Dutch law program, our faculty prides itself for being the most international law faculty here in this country, in the Netherlands, in terms of its teaching, its research, and its student population, of which 55% comes from abroad. And your chair, and your academic and professional record greatly fit that profile. Now, of course, Professor Stewart, there is one thing um, I have been wondering about in the last year. That is how you have perceived moving from your native Vienna to the city of Maastricht. And the first thing to say about this is that that's not a question that the natives from Maastricht would ask themselves they would in fact reverse the question. Why would one ever be willing to move from Maastricht to Vienna? There is no reason for that. And it may be, Kasper, that in the past, if you liked the music from Vienna, that could be a good reason to stay there or to move there if you would come from Maastricht. But alas, that's no longer the case today. Even when it comes to the Viennese waltz, Maastricht has now surpassed Vienna, all thanks to our mutual friend, Mr. André Rieu. So you did, in fact, come to the right university and city. And as a faculty of law, we are truly happy to have you here with us. Now, Professor Stewart, I invite you now to come forward and give your inaugural address entitled Object and Purpose in Text Treaty Law, importance and limits. And 
Dear Mr. Prorector, Pro thanks a lot for this introduction, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, family and friends. Object and purpose in tax treaty law. Importance and limits. It's safe to say that laws are enacted with an aim, function, goal, purpose, intention in mind. This is true for domestic laws, for EU law and for international law. And this is certainly also true um, for international tax law. We may think of the aim of uh, avoiding international juridical double taxation um, or more recently the aim of um, preventing tax treaty abuse. We also hear vague proclamations of um, ensuring that profits should be taxed where value is created and we are confronted with new rules which aim to achieve different purposes at the same time uh, such as the globe rules which aim to comprehensively address the remaining BEPS challenges and, at the same time, um, harmful tax competition. Whenever we introduce, change, um, interpret or apply the law, the object and purpose is there. It is relevant and will remain relevant for all existing and future rules in international tax law. Today's lecture <coughs> is about the object and purpose in tax treaty law. While the object, and purpose in tax uh, the object and purpose has been a relevant means of interpretation under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties for a long time, since the introduction of the principal purposes test rule, or the PP2 rule, it has arguably become more important um, in tax treaty law. The PPT rule specifically refers to the object and purpose, and it may deny treaty benefits if these benefits are not in accordance with the object and purpose of the relevant tax treaty provisions. Today I'm going to begin with the role of the object and purpose under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties to better understand the framework that is relevant for the interpretation and application of tax treaties. What is the meaning of object and purpose? How can we determine the object and purpose? And what is the relevance of the object and purpose? Afterwards, I'm going to discuss the object and purpose under the PPT rule. Has nothing changed compared to situations without the PPT rule? Has the object and pur pur purpose become more relevant in tax treaty law? Is the PPT rule able to go beyond the wording of the relevant treaty provisions? And what are the limits of the wording that are relevant in this context? And finally, I will end with some conclusions. It is possible to distinguish between uh, three different schools of treaty interpretation, which existed already prior to the conclusion of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. We, th we can call them the theological school, the subjective school, and the objective school. What is the purpose of treaty interpretation? According to the theological school, the aim is to determine the object and purpose of a treaty and to give effect to that object and purpose, even where the terms of the treaty fail to be as comprehensive um, as they should be. According to the subjective school, the goal is to determine the intentions of the contracting states and to give effect to those intentions, even where the states did not properly reflect their intentions in the text of the treaty. And according to the objective school, the text must be presumed to be the authentic expression of the intentions of the contracting states. Thus, the primary goal of treaty interpretation is to determine the meaning of the text of the treaty. While the rules of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties reflect a compromise between those three different schools, they require treaty interpretation to rely on the text of the treaty. This textual approach does not mean, however, that the object and purpose of a treaty is irrelevant. On the contrary, the general rule of interpretation under Article 31, Paragraph 1 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties explicitly refers to the object and purpose. A treaty shall be interpreted in good faith in accordance with the ordinary meaning to be given to the terms of the treaty in their context and in the light of its object and purpose. There is no definition of the object and purpose in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Consequently, the meaning of the term 
object and purpose is not clear. I will address today four questions that may come up in this context. First, how many objects and purposes may a treaty have? Only one single overarching object and purpose or multiple objects and purposes? Second, as the Vienna Convention refers to its, the treaty's object and purpose, what about the object and purpose of specific provisions? Third, how can the object and purpose of a treaty of a rule be determined? And finally, how important is the object and purpose for treaty interpretation? It is unclear whether a treaty may only have one single overarching object and purpose or multiple, even conflicting objects and purposes. This may be surprising. Why should a treaty not have multiple objects and purposes? This is less surprising when we take a look at some other provisions of the Vienna Convention which use the term uh, object and purpose. According to um, Article 19, letter C of the Vienna Convention, for instance, a state may formulate a reservation unless the reservation is incompatible with the object and purpose of the treaty. If a treaty would have multiple objects and purposes, a reservation could be compatible with one object and purpose and incompatible with another object and purpose. This would mean that a treaty modification through a reservation could be both acceptable and unacceptable at the same time. And this doesn't seem like a reasonable conclusion. A single overarching object and purpose ensures that the reservation can either be acceptable or unacceptable based on its compatibility with that object and purpose and not both at the same time. However, I believe that the term object and purpose may have different meanings in different contexts. So it also may have different, a different meaning for purposes of interpretation compared to the meaning um, used in other provisions of the Vienna Convention. In addition, for purposes of interpretation, it does not appear that essential whether we group different goals of a treaty into one single overarching object and purpose or whether we accept multiple objects and purposes of a treaty. If the identified goals are helpful for the interpretation, their relevance for the interpretation should not depend on whether um, we accept only a single ob object and purpose or multiple objects and purposes. Article 31, paragraph 1 of the Vienna Convention refers to its, the treaty's object and purpose, not to the object and purpose of the specific treaty provisions. While this distinction is important, and the PPT rule does exactly the opposite, it refers to the object and purpose of the specific treaty provisions and not to the object and purpose of the treaty as a whole, there is a strong connection. The treaty achieves its objects and purpose through the specific treaty provisions, and the tr specific treaty provisions contribute to the achievement of the treaty's goals. Usually, therefore, the specific treaty provisions incorporate and reflect the more general goals of the treaty. As I will also discuss in a moment, the determination of the object and purpose um, of the treaty as a whole includes an analysis of the scope and structure of the specific provisions. Thus, the specific provisions influence the determination of the object and purpose of the treaty as a whole. In addition, the, specific, the object and purpose of specific provisions has to be derived from the available means of interpretation. It therefore automatically becomes part of the interpretation process based on those available means of interpretation. It must therefore be considered together with the object and purpose of the treaty as a whole when interpreting specific treaty provisions. That was the slide I skipped. <laughs> and that brings me to the third point. Um, while Article 31, Paragraph 1 of the Vienna Convention instructs a treaty in the light of, uh, to interpret a treaty in the light of the object and purpose, the Vienna Convention is silent how the object and purpose should be determined. Initially, we may take a look at the title and the preamble, and the title and the preamble may assist in determining um, the object and purpose of a treaty. However, the, um, the object and purpose of a treaty may be described in general or vague terms, thereby lacking the required clarity. And in any case, an initial understanding of the object and purpose of the treaty 
should be confirmed or revised based on the text of the treaty as a whole, including its specific provisions as well as its structure and logic. And finally, it's possible to go beyond the treaty itself to take account of other circumstances, such as those surrounding a treaty's conclusion or other external and supplementary materials. As each treaty is unique, there is no mechanical approach to identifying the object and purpose. All the available means of interpretation pursuant to Article 31 and 32 may play a role and may prove to be helpful in determining the object and purpose of the treaty or of its specific provisions. To some extent, the determination of the object and purpose is also a circular exercise. In order to interpret the terms of the treaty, it is necessary to take account of the object and purpose. But the object and purpose must also be derived from the terms of the treaty itself. This means that the object and purpose is both. The result of interpretation of the treaty as a whole and a means of interpretation to shed light on the ordinary meaning of the terms of the treaty in their context. Article 31, paragraph 1 of the Vienna Convention is also silent about when the object and purpose should be considered and how much weight and relevance it should have compared to other means of interpretation. Yet the Vienna Convention envisions the process of interpretation as a single combined operation. All the various elements, as they are present in any case, interact with each other to give the legally relevant interpretation. This implies that the means of interpretation do not have a predetermined hierarchy or weight, except for a certain distinction between primary and supplementary means of interpretation. Since the process of interpretation is a holistic exercise, the Vienna Convention does not require giving the object or purpose of a treaty or of its specific provisions more or less weight than other means of interpretation. Rather, the relevance and weight of each available means of interpretation, including the object and purpose, depends on the facts and circumstances of each particular case. At the same time, the object and purpose finds its limits in the ordinary or special meaning of the terms of the treaty. The object and purpose, whether determined from the title, the preamble, the whole text, the structure, the logic of the treaty, or from other available means of interpretation, may shed more or less light on the ordinary meaning of the terms of the treaty, but it cannot create an independent reading that is not expressed with the words of the text. As the text must be presumed to be the authentic expression of the state's intentions, under the Vienna Convention, it's not possible to rely on an object and purpose that does not manifest itself in the terms of the treaty. At this point, I could address in great detail which objects and purposes a text treaty may pursue and what relevance these objects and purposes may have. Today, however, I can only summarize some by no means exhaustive conclusions. First, it is impossible to determine the object or purpose of a text treaty without analyzing the structure, logic, and the substance of its specific provisions. If available at all, the title and the preamble are too vague to provide any clear directions, such as what kinds of double taxation are actually addressed by a text treaty and its provisions. Clearly, the objects and purposes of a text treaty must be derived by interpreting its substantive rules. Second, the general desire to achieve a certain goal does not imply that a text treaty must always achieve that goal. Following the textual approach of the Vienna Convention, interpretation is about determining the meaning of the terms of the treaty and not about giving effect to some identified object and purpose. For instance, the objective of not creating opportunities for non-taxation or reduced taxation through tax evasion or avoidance does not imply that such opportunities will never be created. Such opportunities may only be limited within the boundaries of the specific terms of a tax treaty, including its various anti-abuse provisions. Third, while we have established models, every tax treaty is somewhat different, including the circumstances surrounding its conclusion. Thus, the object and purpose may differ. What may be true for a tax treaty following the newest version of the OECD or UN model need not be true for older tax treaties. 
For example, tax avoidance has not been at the forefront of older models, and some tax treaties may have even been designed to permit some forms of tax planning or treaty shopping. And last but not least, tax treaty provisions may pursue specific objects and purposes, which usually advance the general goals of a tax treaty. For example, a certain allocation of taxing rights may pursue the objective of avoiding excessive administrative burdens for the taxpayer and tax administrations. This more specific purpose encourages cross-border exchange and helps developing the economic relationship of the states, contributing to the general goals of the treaty. Yet, objects and purposes may also conflict with each other, requiring difficult decisions about which object and purpose should prevail in a particular case. In case of conflicting objects and purposes, treaty benefits may be in accordance with one object and purpose, but not in accordance with another object and purpose. It is impossible to discuss the role of the object and purpose in tax treaty law without discussing the PPT rule. This rule has been introduced as a result of BEPS Action 6 through the multilateral instrument and is now incorporated in the newest versions of the OECD model and the UN model. It consists of two tests. The first test requires an assessment whether obtaining a tax treaty benefit was one of the principal purposes of any arrangement or transaction. The second test considers whether granting that benefit would be in accordance with the object and purpose of the relevant tax treaty rules. If it is reasonable to conclude that the tax treaty benefit was one of the principal purposes of an arrangement or transaction, the tax treaty benefit is denied unless it is established that granting that benefit would be in accordance with the object and purpose of the relevant tax treaty provisions. The PPT rule raises many issues, most of which I cannot address today. However, one important question connected to the specific role of the object and purpose under the PPT rule is the question of the role of the PPT rule as such. On the one hand, the PPT rule can be understood as relying on the object and purpose of the relevant tax treaty provisions, even beyond the wording. We can call this the beyond the wording approach. Where a taxpayer has no tax motive, he or she can trust the wording of the provisions. In contrast, where the taxpayer pursues a principal tax motive, he or she cannot be sure that the treaty benefits will be granted. Instead, the benefits are denied if they violate the object and purpose of the relevant tax treaty provisions. This means that the object and purpose may take precedence over the wording. The PPT rule arguably leads to a result that would not be possible by merely interpreting the relevant tax treaty provisions in accordance with the Vienna Convention. If I would try to illustrate this appro approach, I would draw on one side the wording and on the other side the object and purpose. As the wording and the object and purpose don't overlap, they, there is a mismatch, a conflict between those, the wording and the object and purpose. Under the Vienna Convention, the limits of interpretation lie in the wording. Through the PPT rule, it is possible to solve this mismatch in favor of the object and purpose. On the other hand, the PPT rule can be seen as a mere reminder that the object and purpose is a relevant means of interpretation under the Vienna Convention. Thus, it should be considered when interpreting and applying a tax treaty. We can call this the signaling function approach. Under the Vienna Convention, the interpretation does not end with the literal reading of the tax treaty provisions. Instead, it is necessary to consider the context, the object and purpose, and other relevant means of interpretation. This is true regardless of whether the tax treaty includes the PPT rule. As a consequence, the PPT rule merely signals the importance of the object and purpose. If the tax treaty benefits are not in accordance with the object and purpose of the relevant tax treaty provisions, they may be denied with and without the PPT rule. 
Well, this approach limits the practical relevance of the PPT rule and raises the question, why did the contracting states decide to include an unnecessary rule? The OECD commentary itself believes that very similar results as those under the PPT rule may be reached without it under a guiding principle of tax treaty interpretation. If I would again try to illustrate this approach, I would draw the object and purpose within the limits of the wording. It is possible to reach a result of interpretation based on the wording without considering the object and purpose. However, under the Vienna Convention, the object and purpose is a relevant means of interpretation. By considering and giving, giving appropriate weight to the object and purpose, it is possible to reach a result of interpretation in accordance with the object and purpose, with and without the PPT rule. <coughs> the two different approaches raise two questions. First, what are the limits of the wording? Do we really need to cross these limits to respect the object and purpose of the relevant rules? And second, how can the object and purpose of the relevant tax treaty provisions conflict with the same wording from which it was derived? Let me start with the first question, the limits of the wording. Based on a mere literal reading of the terms, the wording may initially seem clear and become quite quickly a limit that may be difficult to bring in line with the object and purpose of the relevant tax treaty provisions. However, Article 31, Paragraph 1 of the Vienna Convention, refers to the ordinary meaning of the terms in their context and in the light of the object and purpose. This means that even though the text is the authentic expression of the state's intentions, the ordinary meaning expressing those intentions includes meanings that may become apparent only after taking the object and purpose of the treaty or of its provisions into account. An initially clear meaning may become less clear if the investigation of the object and purpose reveals an incompatibility and new potential ordinary meanings. In many situations, therefore, the potential ordinary meanings of the terms provide enough flexibility to consider the object and purpose beyond a strict reading of the same terms. Let me illustrate this with one example. The second sentence of Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the OECD model states that the term resident of a contracting state does not include any person who is liable to tax in that state in respect only of income from sources in that state or capital situated therein. At first, the literal meaning of these terms provides for a clear outcome. If a person is liable only to source or territorial taxation, he or she is not a tax treaty resident. When looking at the literal meaning of the terms, the provision does not distinguish between, on the one hand, states that tax residents on, the, on a worldwide basis and non-residents on a territorial basis, and, on the other hand, states that tax all persons on a territorial basis. The second sentence of Article 4, Paragraph 1 would indiscriminately deny treaty residents in all cases of territorial taxation. This would be the case even if um, a state adopts a territorial principle taxing both residents and non-residents in respect only of income from sources in that state. Pursuant to the OECD commentary, however, it is not necessary to adhere to the strict understanding of the treaty terms. The second sentence of Article 4, Paragraph 1, I quote, has to, to be interpreted in the light of its object and purpose, which is to exclude persons who are not subject to comprehensive, comprehensive taxation in a state and not to exclude all residents of jurisdictions adopting a territorial principle in their taxation. This interpretation advocated by the OECD commentary goes beyond a strict reading of the text and puts great emphasis on the object and purpose while remaining within the boundaries set by the ordinary meaning of the terms. Before assuming a mismatch between the wording and the object and purpose of a tax treaty provision, we should therefore ask ourselves, is it really not possible to interpret the terms of the tax treaty in accordance with the identified object and purpose? 
let me now turn to the second question. How can the object and purpose of a relevant rule conflict with the same wording from which it was derived? As already discussed, the object and purpose does not appear out of thin air. It must be derived from the text of the treaty, including the treaty's substantive provisions and from other available means of interpretation. Under the Vienna Convention, the object and purpose must further be reflected in the terms of the treaty from which it was derived. There is no independent object and purpose that can be given effect regardless of the text of the treaty. By going beyond the ordinary meaning of the terms in their context and in the light of the object and purpose, the PPT rule would arguably require establishing the object and purpose of the relevant text treaty provisions from the text of the treaty and other available means of interpretation to go beyond the result of interpretation derived from exactly the same text and from the same means of interpretation. This approach would therefore deviate from the established principles of interpretation under the rules of the Vienna Convention. Is it theoretically possible that the contracting states through the PPT rule intended to deviate from the general rule of interpretation in Article 31 of the Vienna Convention? Yes, the contracting states are free to deviate from the principles of the Vienna Convention. Nevertheless, I have doubts whether the available means of interpretation, including the OECD commentary, are sufficient to support and let us conclude that the contracting states indeed intended to disregard the established principles of the Vienna Convention in favor of potentially unpredictable consequences. The danger of going beyond the wording through the PPT rule lies that the PPT rule would potentially introduce an element of interpretation that could rely on what the contracting states should have agreed to and not what they have actually agreed to. Thus, the object and purpose could become some independent means of interpretation that could prevail over the authentic expression of the state's intention. It could override what the contracting states have objectively intended to achieve with what the contracting states should have intended to achieve. Before assuming a mismatch between the wording and the object and purpose of a tax treaty provision, we should therefore ask ourselves, is the identified object and purpose really pursued without any limitations, or should its identified scope rather be revised? If the identified object and purpose is not reflected in the text of the treaty, the contracting states may not have agreed to pursue it, or at least not to the full extent. While most of the examples on the PPT rule relate to business profits or passive income, the scope of the rule goes beyond that. Let me therefore illustrate the difficulties with the beyond the wording approach with an example on the 183-day rule on which I wrote my PhD many years ago. Imagine that an employee is present and works in a state for 360 days. A presence of 360 days in the fiscal year concerned is not a short-term employment for purposes of the 183-day rule. And thus, the rule does not apply. Imagine now that the employee intentionally decides to work from July to December of one year for 180 days, and from January to June of the following year for another 180 days, reaching 360 days of continuous presence. Under the old pre-1992 wording of the 183-day rule, which is still used today in tax treaties, some tax treaties, the fiscal year concerned constitutes the relevant period for calculating the days of presence. A presence of 180 days in the fiscal year concerned can generally benefit from the 183-day rule. So now by changing the work period, the 183-day rule applies and our employee may benefit from no taxation in the state of work and a potentially lowest taxation in the state of residence. Is this conduct in accordance with the object and purpose of the 183-day rule under the old pre-1992 wording to cover only short-term employments? Or should the PPT rule deny treaty benefits by following the beyond the wording approach? 
Let me mention some arguments that can be found in the OECD commentary and in the literature in similar context. Arguably, granting the benefit of the 183-day rule in these circumstances would be contrary to the object and purpose of the rule, as the time limitation of 183 days would otherwise be meaningless if employees could avoid taxation in the state of work by merely changing the work schedule. A confirmation that the object and purpose of the 183-day rule would be defeated also flows from the fact that the newer versions of the OECD model include a different wording to deal with this problem. Thus, the PPT rule could deny the benefit of no taxation in the state of work by going beyond the wording of the 183-day rule. For me, it seems more reasonable to bring the different means of interpretation closer together. If the interpretation of the 183-day rule is incompatible with the identified object and purpose, it may well be wrong. If it is not wrong, and the wording is indeed a limit to an interpretation in accordance with the identified object and purpose, then the identified object and purpose should be reconsidered. Through the explicit wording of the 183-day rule, the contracting states may have accepted some forms of tax planning in favor of a simplified application of the 183-day rule. In addition, the threshold can be seen as an arbitrary threshold if the taxpayer meets um, such arbitrary formal requirements. This should be in accordance with the object and purpose of the rule. So in the case of the 183-day rule, the precise wording should inform about the object and purpose rather than leading to the assumption that the identified object and purpose cannot be brought in line with the same wording from which it was derived. Or to put it differently, the PPT rule should not go beyond the wording of the 183-day rule to implement what the contracting states should have agreed to, arguably the new wording of the 183-day rule, instead of what they have actually agreed to, the old pre-1992 wording. Yet, even if we abandon the beyond the wording approach, the PPT rule is, in my view, more than just a reminder of the fact that the object and purpose is a relevant means of interpretation under the Vienna Convention. Interpretation under the Vienna Convention is not only about the wording and the object and purpose. Various other means of interpretation, including supplementary means of interpretation, influence the interpretation of tax treaty provisions. Interpretation is a complex legal exercise where some means of interpretation may point in one direction and other means of interpretation may point in a different direction. While the object and purpose plays a role in shedding light on the ordinary meaning of the terms of a tax treaty, it has no predetermined relevance or weight. Under a holistic approach, therefore, the result of interpretation need not fully align with the identified object and purpose of the relevant rules. Before reaching this conclusion, we should, of course, reconsider the interpretation and the identified object and purpose. Nevertheless, as long as the result of interpretation stays within the limits of the wording, one may conclude that based on certain means of interpretation, an interpretation that does not fully align with the object and purpose is still more convincing than one that would fully align. In fact, if we encounter multiple conflicting objects and purposes, the result of interpretation by definition cannot fully align with all objects and purposes. A conflict with an object and purpose will remain. What is the meaning of the term beneficial owner, for example. The term beneficial owner does not seem to have a clear, ordinary meaning that would impose relevant lim limits to achieving the object and purpose of the relevant tax treaty provisions, including the object and purpose of not creating opportunities for non-taxation or reduced taxation through treaty shopping arrangements. In addition, according to the OECD commentary, the interpretation of the term beneficial owner is influenced by the object and purpose of the tax treaty, including the purpose of preventing fiscal evasion and avoidance. Nevertheless, the OECD commentary believes 
that the PPT rule may be necessary to deny tax treaty benefits that would otherwise be granted to the beneficial owner, because those benefits would not be in accordance with the object and purpose of the relevant tax treaty provisions. Why do we need the PPT rule to reach this result instead of interpreting the term beneficial owner in accordance with the identified object and purpose? Instead of applying the PPT rule, the condition of beneficial ownership could easily be understood in accordance with the object and purpose of not granting treaty benefits in various treaty shopping situations. Despite that, other means of interpretation, and notably the historical development of the concept of beneficial ownership, and the OECD commentary itself with its explanations, speak in favor of a more narrow understanding of the term beneficial owner, by covering only agents, nominees, and similar persons who have a contractual or legal obligation to pass on the payment received to another person. The limits that the PT rule needs to cross do not lie in the wording or in the term beneficial owner. The limits come from other means of interpretation. The PPT rule is needed to go beyond the traditional narrow understanding of the term beneficial owner derived from those other means of interpretation. It therefore shifts priority to the object and purpose. In my view, the PPT rule should always remain within the limits of the wording of the relevant tax treaty provisions, while being more than just a reminder to consider the object and purpose in accordance with the general rule of interpretation. This approach would continue to follow the general rule, the, the, the well-established rules and limits of interpretation pursuant to the Vienna Convention. If the constructing states were not able to reflect their intentions in the wording of the relevant tax treaty provisions, they have not agreed to pursue it, them. At the same time, where the relevant tax treaty provisions can be interpreted fully in line with the object and purpose as established by relevant means of interpretation, the PPT rule would require giving priority to this object and purpose, even if other means of interpretation speak for a different result. In such situations, the PPT rule could therefore disregard a traditional understanding and interpretation in favor of an interpretation that fully aligns with the object and purpose. It would require giving priority to the object and purpose over other relevant means of interpretation while remaining within the objective limits set by the terms of a tax treaty. And if I would illustrate this approach, I would draw the object and purpose again within the limits of the wording. But we also have other means of interpretation that may speak for a result of interpretation that is not fully in accordance with the object and purpose. And under the holistic approach to interpretation, those other means of interpretation may prevail in a particular case over the object and purpose. The PPT rule, however, would require giving priority to the object and purpose, therefore giving priority to the object and purpose over other means of interpretation while remaining within the well-established limits of the wording. To conclude, whereas the concept of object and purpose might bring clarity and insight, it might equally generate only conflict and irresolution. To me, this quotation about the object and purpose from Professor Trino Christiotis is quite accurate for the area of tax treaty law, where we encounter vague statements about the general goals and many different, sometimes even conflicting objects and purposes. By elevating the object and purpose of specific treaty provisions to the forefront, in particular if a taxpayer intends to receive a tax treaty benefit, the question of what is the object and purpose becomes even more pressing. Well, this is a topic for another day. The question about the object and purpose is a legal question that has to be interpreted, argued, contested, and in the end, decided by courts. It is not an issue of the burden of proof lying with the taxpayer. In my view, we should not leave the established principles of interpretation pursuant to the rules of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties by going beyond or even ignoring 
the wording of the relevant tax treaty provisions. The PPT rule should shift priority to the object and purpose, but within the limits set by the wording. And those limits are often broader than initially appears. Where the object and purpose remains in the dark, it is not able to shed light on the ordinary meaning of the terms of a tax treaty. And thus, where the object and purpose remains in the dark, the application of the PPT rule must fail. The PPT rule should not deny treaty benefits due to a lack of legal clarity about the object and purpose. It is therefore more important than ever to enlighten the object and purpose of tax treaty provisions and I am at the beginning rather than at the end of my journey to the many complexities of the object and purpose. Dear Mr. Prorector, um, dear ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, at the end of this inaugural lecture, please allow me to take a few more moments of your time to thank those who have um, supported me over the years. First, I would like to thank Maastricht University and the Faculty of Law uh, for this appointment. Jan Smith, Raymond Yuluja, other members of the university and the faculty, members of the supervisory committee. I really feel privileged and honored to stand here today that you have put your trust in me. Thank you. I also thank all the colleagues from the Faculty of Law and the Department of Tax Law for giving me such a warm welcome. I uh, feel very much at home here at the faculty, and I can safely say that Maastricht is my new home, and I don't plan to return to Vienna. And um, I love the city, I love the university, and I love the music here in Maastricht. <laughs> um, it is also a real pleasure to see how open, well-organized, and international the faculty is, and how the LLM in international and European tax law flourishes. Um, through its students and staff members, and I'm really happy to be um, part of such a great team. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the professors of the Institute for Austrian International Tax Law in Vienna by giving me the opportunity to join the Institute when I was 22. Um, thank you for the trust, the uh, countless opportunities, and the support I have received over the many years um, which allowed me to grow. Michael Lang, thank you for um, your excellent supervision of my PhD, of my postdoctoral research, uh, of many other research projects, for your invaluable guidance, your support and mentorship. Without you, I would not be here, would not be here today. I also had the pleasure to visit many beautiful places, and for that I'm really thankful. I would like to thank in particular Wolfgang Schön for the support I received and for the wonderful time I had at the Max Planck Institute in Munich during my research stay, and Bertil Wiemann for my research stay at Uppsala University. Kess van Rath, you invited me um, to lecture at the International Tax Center in Leiden five years ago, I have heard, or maybe um, around that time. And that allowed me to learn and discuss about the role of the PPT rule, which contributed um, to today's lecture, and it was always a great experience. Thank you very much. Um, I would not be here today without many excellent colleagues and friends I have worked with in the past and who have, I have the pleasure to meet and discuss at many places, at conferences, during research days, um, at some coffee break. I, I learned a lot and I'm really happy and it's so nice to see many of you here um, today. I would also like to thank my former colleagues at KPMG for their support and guidance, Hans Zöchling, Florian, uh, Bruga, thank you for the many challenges, uh, opportunities, and insights I had the pleasure to enjoy. Thanks also to all my friends, in particular from Vienna, whom I, I've known for uh, so many years. Um, also, always feel free to visit me in Maastricht. And my deepest thanks go to my parents, who are here with me today. I would not know where to start and where to end. There is um, so much I need to thank you for. And last, but certainly not least, um, a special thanks to my wife, uh, Natalie, and uh, my son, Simon. Um, Natalie, thank you for all your love, patience, trust, and support. Um, you're the best mom and wife I can imagine. Thank you very much. And Simon, thank you for being such a lovely son. Um, I always have so much fun with you. 
Um, finally, I would like to thank you uh, for your attention and for being a part of this um, special occasion. Thank you, danke, gracias, dziękuję, bedankt, uh, ich hab gesagt. Thank you so much, Professor Tewards, for a wonderful inaugural lecture. Um, I think that the, the choice of topic for your lecture um, was quite uh, logical. Uh, in the last few decades, we have had at this university quite a few inaugural lectures about the Maastricht Treaty. I think it makes a lot of sense to discuss now the Vienna Convention. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. Um, many congratulations on your appointment. Um, our students and staff are all very much looking forward to continuing working uh, with you, both within your department, uh, within the faculty, and within the university as a whole. Um, I also congratulate uh, your wife, Natalie, and your son, uh, Simon, and your parents, both present here, and all other family and friends present here in the room or watching this ceremony online. We are also closely reaching the end uh, of this event, um, and I want to thank you all for joining here uh, in this room um, or for joining us online. Um, I have one practical remark, which is a remark, first of all, to everyone who is here in, with us here in the, uh, in the Ola. Um, I'd like to say that there will be a reception that is going to take place right here in the refectorium here in this building. Um, where you can congratulate uh, Professor Stewart. Uh, and to all the participants online, I would like to propose that you uh, say a prosit to Casper at home or wherever uh, you are, in Vienna or elsewhere. Uh, and with this, I close this academic ceremony. <laughs>